All righty, welcome back. So yeah, let us uh, talk about CMEs and Tom Berger will be uh, doing most of the presenting today. Um, and yeah, I'll well, turn it over on. to Tom. Uh -oh. Sorry, I couldn't click on the got it to acknowledge the recording without stopping sharing. But uh, here we go. Um, today's lecture is going to be a whirlwind tour of coronal mass ejections, uh, transitioning into the space weather aspects of the course. Uh, we won't get into too much space weather today, uh, per se. We're going to talk specifically on the characteristics of CMEs uh, to start, you know, what they are, what they look like, how they compare to the solar wind, for instance. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about a unifying concept that I think um, explains any CME that you might want to throw at me, either from an active region or from a quiet region. Uh, there's a lot of history behind that, and it's um, it has been a long time coming, but I think we're finally to the point where we can say there is a consensus on what these things are, model-wise and theory-wise. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about CMEs as they propagate through interplanetary space and what they can do to the um, specifically to the energetic charged particle environment. And Steve will give uh, most of those slides. Those are his slides primarily, um, and it's a it's a field that I'm peripherally aware of and, and knowledgeable about, but I'm sure Steve has some more in-depth things to say about it. And then if we have time, we'll get to the a little bit of the space weather aspects of CMEs um, as, a, as a preface for next week's dive into really what space weather is, which is basically predictive science of impactful events. So let's jump right in. Um, just to review, solar wind characteristics as a preview of contrasting this with CMEs, you can see from this that it was very convenient that they did this experiment with SUBI during solar minimum because they didn't capture any CMEs that I can see in this movie. And so we're basically looking here at what we call the background or ambient solar wind just flowing out pretty constantly from the sun in a, in a relatively simple structure during this solar minimum time. And, you know, as we recall, the slow solar wind is somewhere between 300 to 500 kilometers per second. The fast solar wind could be 600 to 800 kilometers per second, um, particularly through coronal holes. And you can see a nice coronal hole going down to the equatorial region. There's one coming across the front of the disk there. And that, the other thing about solar wind that's, that's um, important is that it has a 27 day, often does have a 27 day recurrence. So if you get a fast solar wind stream from a coronal hole, that'll be back in about 27 days or so. So it's got a pretty regular structure to it. Now, if we contrast that with CMEs by looking at this particular image of uh, a coronagraph, uh, again, image of a flare that took place back in 2017, we can see a lot of differences here. Um, it's a very transient, very impulsive structure, very, very different looking than the CME. You can, as a, as a preface for our later discussion, you can see all the snow on the detector there caused by energetic particles being accelerated by the, the event. And this particular CME was, was one of the more rapid ones uh, with a maximum speed of, of 1950 kilometers per second. So you can see right away, it's, it's much, much faster than even the fastest solar wind streams. The diagram on the left there is a diagram of speed as a function of angle around the sun. So measuring the angle from the north here and showing that there are pockets of slower speed, but for the most part, it's a very, very fast event. Um, and so sometimes you'll hear these uh, CMEs called solar wind transients or solar wind structures. Um, and of course, we know there are transient effects in the solar wind, but I really don't like that term. I think that CMEs really should be distinguished from solar wind as a, as a very different phenomenon with a very different driver physics behind them, as we'll see. So it's, it's pretty clear when you see a CME what a CME is. If we zoom out a little farther, this is the Lasco C3 coronagraph. And here you can see again, it's a very structured, uh, very impulsive event. And it's interesting if you look at this streamer structure here, which is part of the kind of the background ambient solar wind, uh, 
you can see it being um, bent by the CME as the CME pushes out through the ambient solar wind. So that's another distinct, distinction between a CME and the solar wind. Um, the solar wind structure and even its, even its kind of basal magnetic field structure can be um, modified by CMEs as they go through. And you can see on the, on the right there, the average, some of the average CME quantities, uh, properties. The average speed is actually pretty low. I, I was surprised by this. It was uh, 489 kilometers per second, but they get up to about 3000 kilometers per second. The fastest CME on record was recorded back in 1972 at 3000 kilometers. That's 14 and a half hours from the sun to the earth, which is actually faster than the Carrington event in 1859 which took about 17 hours. Um, you can see angular width, they usually comprise about 45 degrees of the angular width around the sun. Mass, it's just, a, it's just an astronomical number, hard to interpret, but 10 to the 12 kilograms of plasma coming out. And then the kinetic energy on the order of 10 to the 23 joules. So comparable to flare kinetic energies or flare energies rather in some sense. Um, I thought it was interesting though, when I looked at this, the average speed of a CME is slower than the solar escape velocity of 600 kilometers per second. So that gives you something to think about for how these things do escape the gravity well. Um, there's a special term that we use to describe CMEs headed directly towards the earth and that's halo CME. So this is just a quick movie that's playing a little choppy of a halo CME. You can see the reason it's called a halo is it sort of surrounds the entire sun um, and that means that we're looking kind of directly at the structure coming out towards us. So just for terminology's sake, when you hear halo CME, that's what it's talking about, something coming directly towards the observer. So now some, uh, some more, uh, a little bit more in-depth look that, at how CMEs differ from solar wind, even transient solar wind structures like CIRs, for instance, can be distinguished from CMEs pretty clearly generally by the steep shock that you see in the CME. On the left, on the red, that, that's, these are, this is a superposed epoch analysis where you have 49 CME traces of interplanetary stuff stacked on top of each other. And you can see there's generally on a, in a CME trace a pretty well-defined shock in a lot of the properties. Whereas the CIR shows things like a very strong rotation in the, in the phi direction of the velocity. Uh, but otherwise not very shock-like uh, behavior. However, I have seen some C CIRs in the past which do have pretty sharp shocks, so it's not always that um, clear a distinction. But on the average, this is a good way of looking at it. Um, again, uh, distinguishing between CME arrival defined by a shock, CIR arrival defined by a sudden change in V phi, and then temperature rapid, uh, rapidly rising in the case of a CME more gradually in the case uh, of, a, of a CIR and also stays quite high for a CIR because that hot coronal plasma is continually coming through on the high speed stream. So another thing that people like to point out at CMEs is they seem to have a part, sort of a three part structure as they come off of the sun and, and transit through the interplanetary medium. Although we'll see that's not quite so simple when you get out farther from the sun. But in general, we talk about the three-part structure, meaning in the front of the CME, there's a shock followed by a sheath region, uh, followed by a cavity or a void, as it's called out on this uh, left-hand structure. And then finally, in the middle of the void, you'll often see a, a much brighter material, which is um, generally believed to be filament plasma that's being ejected with the magnetic structure of the CME. So on the right, you see pretty much the same thing taken a long time ago. <laughs> the Solar Maximum mission uh, in 1980. And you can see again, there's a, a sheath shock structure in front of a cavity followed by a filament. But again, if you follow this further on, you see the filament structure gets quite complex. Uh, so it's not always this nice three-part structure all the way out uh, as it goes um, propagating through space. If we look at what the structure of a CME is measured in situ, and this is Looking in more detail at one of those plots I showed earlier, the, 40, the average 49 plots, this is one of those types of plots, which shows quite clearly in the magnitude of the, of the uh, magnetic field on the top, 
the Z direction of the magnetic field, the up and down direction of the magnetic field vector in the middle, and then the BX and BY components on the bottom that you can, you can very clearly see when this thing arrives because generally you see this magnetic field shock, very, very uh, abrupt change in both the magnitude and then variations in the directions, particularly the BX and BY, um, as, the, as the event uh, progresses. The sheath region is generally identified with this sort of oscillatory um, uh, and high magnitude um, region in the magnetic field strength. And then behind that, you'll often see the BZ uh, component of the CME rotate. So that here we have uh, B, it goes to the uh, BZ goes negative, in other words, a southerly pointing uh, BZ vector component. And then it will rotate positive, sometimes with, with little dips in the middle, indicating substructure of this, uh, of this CME, and then back down. So that's a very clear signature in the magnetic field of a CME propagating through interplanetary space. Now, if we look at the solar wind, quote unquote, plasma um, uh, so quantities here, we can see that it looks a little bit different. It's a little smoother in particular. But it definitely shows this velocity shock. This is the proton velocity coming straight into the Faraday cup of the Discover satellite, or L1 in this case. Um, interestingly enough, the density shock is not at the same time. Uh, the density shock comes later, and that's just due to the, the most of the mass of the CME arriving after the main shock wave is hit. Uh, the sheath region, however, does encompass that entire structure. So. And you can see, as, as noted before, the temperature rises, not necessarily right after the shock, but as the CME, the main body of the CME comes through, and then it drops down again uh, after, in this case, about a day. Uh, density is doing about the same thing. So Now, there's a, another terminology that I'd like to introduce and, um, and have people be aware of. You'll sometimes hear it said that um, a CME is not really a CME until it's been detected in interplanetary space, as we just showed through the DISCOVER measurements. And people like to call these things interplanetary CMEs or ICMEs. So you'll sometimes hear ICMEs talked about rather than just plain CMEs. Uh, these same people who use this terminology usually will insist that you can't call something you see erupt into space off of an SDO movie a CME. In other words, it has to be detected in interplanetary space, either in situ or with a coronagraph, wide field coronagraph image before you can really call it a, uh, a CME or an ICME in this case. So I don't particularly subscribe to this terminology, but it's important uh, to, to know what people mean when they say ICME. Okay, so there are many signatures of, of CMEs in the corona of the sun. In other words, if you zoom into the sun and look at the source region, of CMEs, you see a lot of signatures. And in particular, the obvious number one association with CMEs is our, our solar flares. And flares, of course, are electromagnetic radiation or photons emitted during and following a large scale eruption that usually e ejects a, a CME along with it. Um, in addition, um, there are <clears throat> things called filament eruptions or sigmoid eruptions. These are really the same thing. A filament is just plasma trapped in a twisted magnetic flux ropes configuration outside of an active region or outside the core of an active region, usually whereas a sigmoid is a very tightly twisted, smaller scale, typically magnetic flux rope, typically found right in the middle of a sunspot active region. But they're basically both um, plasma trapped in a, in a very twisted magnetic field uh, structure. Finally, and I'll show, I'll show examples of all these things in, in the subsequent slides. This is kind of a boring slide, but I just want to give you this list. It's from the paper cited down at the bottom, and it's an incomplete list, as we'll see later, but it does kind of capture a lot of the major things we do see. We also see what are called EIT waves after the instrument on the SOHO satellite, the Extreme Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope, or EUV waves. These are blast waves propagating out across the sun and seen in UV. Uh, they can also be seen in the chromosphere in H alpha, where they're called Morton waves, which were actually discovered long before the EIT mission. Uh, coronal dimmings are something we'll demonstrate where the removal of the material by the CME from the corona leads to sudden uh, density or intensity uh, decrease. Um, 
And then finally, post-eruptive arcades or brightening, also called post-flare loops. You'll often see these structures after a major flare and CME, indicative of the magnetic field returning to more loop-like or potential field-like topology. So let's take a look at some of these things, in particular, the flares. And I don't think you can hear the music too well. <laughs> there is music with this. This is from the uh, Goddard Science Visualization Studio, um, showing a very active region recorded in September of 2017, the same region I showed having a CME in that earlier um, series of coronagraph movies. And you can see, obviously, that this is a very, very active and, and very um, flaring active region um, beginning on about September 4th. As we come to September 6th, which is coming up here, you'll see the X9.3 flare, which was also associated with the CMEs that I showed earlier. It's interesting that just before an X9.3, the region let off an X2.2. So there was the largest flare of solar cycle 24. Here it is zoomed in. Also the eighth largest X-ray flare ever recorded. And if a flare that big doesn't have a CME, something really strange is going on. So you can generally be rest assured that if a flare that big occurs, there's going to be a CME of some kind. We'll get to interesting cases where there have been fairly large flares without the CME escaping the magnetic grip of the sun later. But for now, that's a good look at flares. Now let's go to filament eruptions. This is the largest filament eruption ever recorded. By far, we've never seen anything like this. This was taken way back in 1945 at the Climax Observatory here in Colorado by Walter Roberts, the founder of the High Altitude Observatory. And uh, using the first Leo coronagraph ever produced in the United States. In fact, Bernard Leo came over from France to help him with this. Not maybe this observation, but the, the coronagraph itself. So this is obviously a CME, this material uh, obviously escapes the gravity well of the sun. Some of it drains back down on the foot points, as you can see. But um, filament eruptions are fairly good indications that something is going to leave the sun. And what is a filament again? It's, it, it's, a, it's something that looks absorptive on the disk. So here is a filament on the disk. This is taken in the H alpha wavelength. Uh, but it's the same thing as a prominence on the limb. It's really this, in fact, this is a nice illustration because you can see. This is one long magnetic structure going from disk center all the way to the east limb. And the prominence is just the plasma of the filament seen in emission off the limb. So it's all the same thing. It's, it's plasma trapped in a magnetic structure fairly low down in the atmosphere, um, but which almost always do erupt eventually. So something's going on with filaments. And here's a magnetogram of that same disk area. Overlaying the filament, you can see that filaments, of course, occur along polarity inversion lines or neutral lines, as they're called, regions where the, the polarity of the photospheric field changes. Um, so that's where you're going to find filaments. These are the longest structures in the solar magnetic pantheon. This particular uh, flux rope shown here in a, in a full sun view from stereo when it had um, the spacecraft looking at two sides of the sun at the same time shows that this particular uh, filament region was about 600 megameters long, in other words, about a solar radius long. There's nothing magnetic on the sun, coherently magnetic on the sun that's as large as filaments and filament channels. This is another um, movie of an eruption of a filament, uh, showing that this is one of the things that uh, is characteristic of filament eruptions. You can have a fairly large filament eruption but not much X-ray um, emission. In other words, there was a very small flare associated with this filament, um, but not much of anything to speak of. And this speaks to the energy content, the energy um, 
uh, of a filament eruption compared to an active region eruption like the X9.3 flare eruption that we saw earlier. Uh, just to make sure that was a, a CME, and we can even call it an ICME, here is the chronograph movie of that same event, showing that, yes, indeed, quite a bit of plasma did escape the gravity well and go into interplanetary space. So one of the things that was left off of the list I showed earlier was that filaments in particular, and prominences when they're seen off the limb, are often uh, at least away from active regions, accompanied by what are called coronal cavities. And this is a movie of a coronal cavity uh, with a prominence shown here uh, below it. And you can see the prominence plasma as it rises into that um, coronal cavity. This darker area here in the corona is obviously um, twisting around the axis of the, of the uh, coronal cavity. In other words, following the twisted magnetic field lines, which comprise the flux rope, uh, which creates the cavity. So the magnetic pressure in the cavity is actually forcing out the coronal plasma around it, leaving this void. But then you have this prominence plasma, uh, in this case being ejected upwards into the um, filament itself. So good evidence that there's twisted magnetic field there. So again, there, these are large twisted magnetic flux ropes in the corona, sometimes up in the high corona like this, sometimes down low. And prominence is the Prominences are the plasma associated with those filaments and, uh, and cavities. This is another great example of a, uh, a cavity uh, eruption, filament eruption. So here is the coronal cavity suspended way up in space. This was caught just before the eruption. Here is the elongated filament plasma. And when I play the movie, you can see that um, that eventually erupts, again, causing sort of a two sort of a dual foot point um, signature in the low corona, as seen here in SDO, SDO AI-171. But again, not much of a flare to speak of. And this has been quite well modeled. Um, this is a paper by Van Balahoyen and our own Steve Cranmer on uh, magnetic flux ropes in the corona with uh, current sheets below them, which are, are modeled to have tangled um, magnetic field, which is why you get that plasma draining or going up in a very complicated and, and sort of non-laminar uh, flow associated with the magnetic flux rope. Another one of the low coronal signatures often associated with CME um, eruptions are things called sigmoids, originally seen in X-ray images from the Yoko satellite. And this is uh, from the XRT satellite on Kenode. And they're called sigmoids because they have this S-shaped um, curved structure. Turns out these are explainable again by magnetic flux ropes forming in low in the corona now around an active region. So these are essentially filaments with x-ray emitting plasma in them, um, tightly wound around sunspot active regions. There's a model by Titov and Demolan from way back in 99, which pretty accurately uh, reproduced these by simply taking two opposite polarity sunspot magnetic fields, as you see in that diagram on the upper right, and shearing, and, uh, shearing them and twisting the field slightly, uh, you can develop these sigmoids pretty successfully. And the bottom two show the twisted magnetic fields on the left and the overlying kind of trapping magnetic field uh, configuration on the right. And that trapping magnetic field will become important as we talk about confined eruptions again. This is another signature of uh, often associated with eruptive uh, uh, events on the sun, which typically produce CMEs. This is called, this is an EIT wave. And what we're looking at is a three color difference movie. So what you're about to see is the difference in each frame of three different colors, each color representing a different wavelength in the SDO AIA uh, data, 211, 193, and 171 in this case. So watch closely this active region here uh, towards the bottom is uh, going to experience an eruption. And you'll see the disturbance travel outward, basically across the entire solar disk. It's a nice slow filament eruption CME going on on the upper right there. And there's the major eruption. 
So these are not that common. They, they typically occur only around the largest flares. Um, although it may be one of those things that we just don't have the sensitivity to observe them on the smaller flares. They may be something that are quite common with all flares. Uh, it just takes a really big one to make this much change in the corona to be visible. So again, these are named after the EIT instrument from SOHO. And they're also now called EUV waves just because it's been seen in a lot of other instruments since EIT. And finally, coronal dimming. This is, as I mentioned, when the CME is erupting off the sun, it's pulling a lot of plasma with it. And so you'll see some of the corona dim as it uh, leaves. This is a YouTube movie of an event back in 2014. And in particular, look here, you can see a very distinct dimming event taking place pretty far away from the active region, actually, which indicates the CME foot points are actually quite far uh, in extent. You can also see an EIT wave there as it, uh, the, the main eruption takes place. So often EIT waves and coronal dimming will accompany one another to indicate that CME has indeed been launched uh, from this eruption. And finally, post-flare loops or post-flare arcades, as they're sometimes called, are again, fairly common, but um, usually not this pronounced. This was a very large flare back in July of 2000, image with the TRACE satellite in the 195 EUV channel. And you can see this is basically the neutral line that defines a very large filament channel through this active region. And the eruption takes place along that filament channel, the neutral line, of course. And afterwards, you get these more potential-like loops across the opposite polarity magnetic field structure. And that's called an arcade because it looks like a tunnel that lights up. Um, just to let you see the CME associated with this monster, that was a halo CME. It goes so quick, you can almost not see the halo CME, but there it is. And you get immediately hit by um, a solar energetic particle in that. That was an extremely large eruption that caused a very large uh, geomagnetic storm that we'll talk about in the coming weeks, and also a fairly large radiation storm, as you can see by the uh, movie on the right. So this is another example uh, from more recently, September 10th, 2017. This is the uh, 11th largest flare on record. It was an X 8.2 at the limb of the sun. So it shot this CME straight out towards Mars. Mars actually had a very significant radiation event from this particular event. But again, you can see the post-flare loop arcades forming at the end um, along, in this case, we're kind of looking almost down the, the tunnel. No, I guess it's kind of, uh, we're looking kind of at the side of the, the neutral line tunnel. That's a very interesting eruption. We're gonna look at that more in a little bit. So again, the 11th brightest X-ray flare on record. It also had a very large uh, EIT wave, the, the line here showing the extent of the wave. So th this flare basically took, took place at 90 degrees on the, the west limb of the sun, but the wave propagated all the way across the sun um, to disk center. And if we play the movie, you'll be able to see it and the post flare loop arcades down here. So there goes the EIT wave, it's pretty quick. But there again are the post-flare loop arcades uh, forming after the very large eruption. So finally, to top off the, this discussion of properties, you can find a lot of these properties in the Cactus CME catalog. This has uh, CME listings going all the way back to 1995, the start of the SOHO mission. Interestingly enough though, um, this is a plot of sun of year on the bottom with the sunspot number shown in black. So this is solar cycle 23, this is solar cycle 24, and this is on the uh, left-hand axis, the number of daily CMEs. Uh, and in, that's in green shown here by the uh, cactus uh, catalog. And what's interesting is there are fewer CMEs per day during the much stronger cycle 23 than there were recorded in cycle 24. And I think this is one of those times where you have to really take, you know, uh, dig into how this catalog is created. It's an automated catalog. And I think what's, what's happened based on LASCO CME um, coronagraph data, I think what's happened is over time, they've upgraded the algorithm to capture more and smaller CMEs. Uh, 
And so it, it's a little bit misleading because we all know that certainly solar cycle 24 was not as active as solar cycle 23. Uh, and yet they find many more CMEs per day in total for solar cycle 24 in this, in this catalog. So just be aware of that. This is a, a plot from a paper on this particular catalog in which they show, you know, indeed average sunspot number and CMEs per day should be pretty well linearly correlated. And yet their own catalog sort of violates that law by having many more CMEs during this very weak cycle. But uh, that's, that's, you know, that's the kind of thing you have to be careful with, with automated or updated catalogs. People tend to change how they make things over time. Same thing happened with the sunspot catalog, by the way. It changed over time what the definition of a sunspot or how you count sunspots uh, it, it is carried out. So you have to be careful with that with sunspot catalogs too. Okay, so let's get to this, this unifying concept that I talked about earlier, that solar magnetic eruptions are what you should talk about not flares and CMEs and other things as sort of disjointed phenomenon. It's all one phenomenon taking place on the sun. And the basic elements of the, con of the concept are that, as I mentioned, you have to have a magnetic flux rope um, formed somewhere on the sun, either in the quiet sun by shearing of large scale fields or in an active region by shearing of very high, uh, high magnitude active region fields. And these, these Magnetic flux ropes are basically formed, again, by these convective motions, either shearing or, or, or large-scale twisting in the, in the uh, active region itself. And what happens is you take what is originally a fairly relaxed potential field of the magnetic, uh, uh, fairly relaxed potential magnetic configuration, and by twisting and shearing, you end up with a non-potential field, sometimes called a nonlinear force-free field, uh, if you want to use more words. And those nonlinear force-free fields or non-potential magnetic fields have the potential of storing energy. They can, and, and they, they can build up free energy that can be converted to kinetic energy of the coronal plasma to accelerate particles and drive CMEs and flares and other things. Uh, and magnetic reconnection is, of course, the, the baseline physical mechanism that allows these uh, highly twisted and highly complex magnetic fields to finally erupt through reconnection of foot point fields and other things as we'll see shortly. So to look at a little more detail, you know, one of the things you can ask, well, are, are flux ropes really real? Do they really, are they really observed on the sun? Can we really model them? And the answer is yes, going all the way back to a, a seminal paper in 1989 by uh, Odd Van Balahoyen and, and Pete Martins, um, they showed analytically that you could actually form twisted magnetic flux ropes through shearing a bipolar magnetic field and then uh, allowing reconnection to occur along the neutral line, which is shown by this dashed line here. So you start here, and over time, you build up through reconnection a highly twisted field, again, following that neutral line in the, in the photosphere. On the right, we show a more modern version of this. It's actually an ideal MHD simulation based on an actual magnetogram uh, from 2014 uh, in the paper by Amari et al., and indeed, they show over time that twisted magnetic flux is what you would expect from that kind of an active region configuration. And here again, if you twist it up enough, uh, over time, you get a sigmoid formation. So sigmoids, filaments, all these things are simply twisted non-potential magnetic flux, building up energy, storing energy uh, that can be released in the eruption. And this is a movie by Yu Hong Fan at HAO of, again, an MHD simulation of a flux rope rising through the chromosphere, continuing to be twisted at its foot points, which is a little hard to see here. Uh, but that twist and that energy addition into the, into the magnetic field uh, give rise to buoyancy. That buoyancy eventually overcomes the overlying field tension. And eventually, you get the eruption. And again, the eruption not really shown here because it's not simulatable in ideal MHD simulations, but reconnection of those foot points does have to occur. Here it's done numerically, but physically there is reconnection of the magnetic fields at the foot points leading to that eruption, um, allowing that, that structure to escape the sun. And I'll back up a little bit to show you that on the right here, she simulated what this would look like in AIA 304 by adding some plasma that gets trapped in this um, flux rope configuration. I don't quite understand how 
it ends up looking like it does compared to other filaments I've seen, but it does show that during the eruption, that plasma uh, rises in a loop-like structure. There might even be some instabilities going on in the edge here uh, to form that core of the three-part structure that we saw earlier. So this was a fairly modern simulation done back in 2018, uh, again, by Yu Hong Fan at HAO. So we always like to have cartoons in solar physics to simplify these very complicated dynamics. And one of the classics is shown here from a paper by Coe et al in 2003. It's really what some people call the standard flare model. Uh, I call it the standard eruption model because it's really modeling an eruption. But again, here you have the plasma plus magnetic field ejected in the CME, the flux rope being ejected as the CME dragging plasma up with it sometimes. The reconnection is taking place below that, forming a current sheet. And with reconnection inflow and acceleration, you get particles and plasma being blasted down as well as blasted out. And the particles and plasma that are blasted down end up colliding with essentially the loop-like potential. This is the, would be the post-flare loop arcade essentially below uh, the flux rope eruption. And that's what causes the flare. So the flare is simply the photonic uh, emission due to the eruption acceleration of plasma and particles back downwards and outwards in the form of a CME. And you can see it's quite complicated. There's Mach 2 jets, there's termination shocks. You have the X-ray loops, the, the UV loops and H alpha loops. You have condensation, evaporation of the chromosphere at the foot points, all leading to this very complicated flare and post-flare structure. But it's all related to the same thing, reconnection of field of a non-potential flux rope, which ejects the flux rope and causes the photonic flare below it. This is an older cartoon shown on the right uh, by Terry Forbes. And again, he's just sort of highlighting that you get the two ribbon, classic two ribbon flare at the foot points of the X-ray loops. The prominence or flux rope is ejected. There's the cavity of the CME, the plasma pileup or sheath as we might call it these days and the shock. So this is all kind of coming together as one coherent model. This particular model, when you, when you talk about X-rays and, and UV loops and things, it's really an active region eruption. But the same thing, as we saw earlier, occurs with filaments. They are just non-active region flux ropes that are rejected a little less energetically, a little slower, right? So one of the things that's always been kind of vexing to the field, or was anyway, until this concept of a magnetic flux rope eruption came about was that sometimes you can get a very large flare, but no CME. You know, how can that possibly be? A pretty big eruption in the case of the 24 October 2014 flare that Amari modeled. This is an X 3.1 flare. It was a huge sunspot. It was the largest sunspot of solar cycle 24, large flare, and yet there was no interplanetary CME. Nothing got ejected from the sun. Uh, there's another event on 27 May 2002 that was an M2 flare, again, a very significant flare, but there was no ejection of material. And this was modeled by Torek and Klein here, um, or Clean, I should say, uh, back in 2005, um, very successfully showing that they could model this as a flux rope, which rose, but did not quite have the energy to reconnect and be ejected, exactly as was observed in this 2002 uh, case by the trace satellite at the time. So basically a confined eruption is, <laughs> I didn't finish the sentence, either overlying field kind of holding down the eruption as in the case of the Amari et al. 2018 model of the 2014 event, or, whoops, I'm sorry, or it, as I was going to say, uh, it can be the case where a toric and climb show that you do not quite have enough buoyancy and energy ejection to get this thing to actually reconnect and take off. Um, and there's also some overlying field that uh, is involved in the, in the toric and climb model as well. Now, there are other models called breakout models, which posit that the reconnection at the top of this loop, for instance, with its overlying field is what eventually allows it to escape and, and form a CME. Um, this is a, you know, not necessarily a, a conflicting model, it's just a, it just emphasizes that 
there is probably magnetic reconnection going on at the top of the flux rope in, in addition to at the bottom of the flux rope to allow it to escape its overlying field. Um, now, the other thing that we've often seen is a large CME without a flare. And that, that was a mystery to people for a long time. And how can you have a CME if you don't have a flare? Even if, you know, even if there, sometimes these CMEs were huge and pretty fast. Um, that's really, again, explainable by uh, film interruptions. Film interruptions, as we'll see, can be very stealthy. They, they don't necessarily have to be from an active region. They're not energetic enough to accelerate plasma during the reconnection current sheets down to the chromosphere to cause uh, X-ray emission and post-flare loops, and yet they're still uh, CMEs. And sometimes, uh, this is the, the famous 7 June 2011 uh, event that I showed a few weeks back. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good example of sometimes you can have eruptions which do cause CMEs, al although most of the filament plasma, for whatever reason, doesn't quite uh, achieve escape velocity and does come back um, to the chromosphere. So this is, um, again, not an example of a confined eruption because there was quite a bit of material seen here leaving the sun. And yet there was also quite a bit of material coming back to the sun in this case. So these are complex beasts, but I think it, you know, if you look at it in terms of flux ropes and plasma carried with the flux rope, uh, in any case, active region or filament eruption, it all kind of makes sense. So as I mentioned, some of these CMEs can be really stealthy. This is an example of an event in 20, back on 25 June, in which if you look at this region here, you can see a filament rising and then a small filament rising and then some disturbance in the coronal plasma there. And the question was, was, was that a CME? Again, the ICME people would say, well, we, you can't say for sure because you didn't really see anything in interplanetary space. Um, but I was pretty sure it was a CME. Here is, again, a difference movie showing the size and extent of that eruption on the sun. So the thing about filament eruptions, as we saw with the grandpa eruption we showed earlier, these are the largest eruptions in terms of sheer size by far, much, much larger than an active region extent. And yet they can be quite slow and they can be, uh, in this case, not at all flaring. This is the extent of the X-ray emission from that event. Even though the sun was pretty quiet at that time, it almost didn't register at all. And so, um, again, CMEs do not have to have flares the flux rope can erupt without having enough energy to cause photonic emission from the chromosphere. A stricter definition of CMEs, a stealth CMEs that you might see is that nothing can be detected in the chroma. So this is a maybe not a so stealthy CME because you can see quite a bit of disturbance in the low corona. Um, there are other cases where you can see almost nothing. The, the filament erupts, there's almost no sign of the eruption at all. And yet um, it does create a CME. This again is just an illustration of yes, indeed, that was a, a CME creating event. There's the eruption, there's the CME. So the ICME people are happy. The ICME police, I should call them. Um, and uh, that takes us to the end of discussing kind of what a CME is and, and how it might be created. Um, running a little short on time, but we wanna branch now into radiation storms and in particular, how CMEs cause eruptions, in particular CMEs, how they cause these giant radiation storms as shown here in 2003. This was the biggest radiation storm of the, the 21st century um, caused by the Halloween 2003 storms. Got up to S4 intensity. On the NOAA scale, that means you're above 10 to the four in the 10 MAV proton scale. So this was quite an event. And uh, it's quite an interesting story as to how these are actually created by CMEs and solar eruptions. So with that, I think I'll hand it over to Steve to talk to these slides on SCPs and acceleration. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, these SCPs are kind of a... I'm sorry? Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of amazing in that the, uh, uh, their energies... Oh, you're not? I am unmuted. Can anybody else hear me? No. Hello, hello. Yes. Can I hear you. Can hear you. 
Others can hear me. Oh, that's strange. Okay, well, I'll keep talking. It'll be on the recording. If Tom can't hear me, I'm not quite sure why. Um, uh, it's, it's, can, it, can anybody hear Steve? It's not just me. Yeah. Yes. We can Maybe it has to do with the fact that you're sharing the slides. I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, that's fine. You want to keep sharing the slides? Yeah, no, I'm, I had my volume down because of the Oh, map. okay. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yes. Okay, no, where were the, we? These SCPs are kind of amazing, right? They have energies of, you know, tens to hundreds of MEVs to sometimes GEV energies, right? The standard thermal uh, particles in the solar wind have only, you know, tens to hundreds of EV energies. Um, they're measured by spacecraft, and th in the past, they've generally been classified into these two categories here, impulsive and gradual, just going by their, their, their duration. Um, again, I, Tom mentioned that, you know, CMEs and flares are, are all sort of unique beasts. So uh, this, this general association that this chart makes between impulsive SCPs having to do with flares and jets and gradual SCPs having to do with the large CMEs as they accelerate out due to their shocks. That's not always, uh, it's not always true. It's basically, you know, many, many of them are of this type and many of them are of that type. Um, yeah, I guess the, 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 we want to talk mostly about the latter category, but yeah, flares and, and, and coronal jets and small sort of sub CME type eruptions that you can sometimes see are often associated with these impulsive SCP events um, that are primarily due to electron acceleration. The gradual SCPs that we'll talk about right now are mainly due to proton and heavy ion acceleration, again, in the shocks that are ahead of the, the CMEs. And they can go over these large ranges of longitude as these things expand out into the solar wind. So you don't have to be pointed right directly at it to feel the effects. So yeah, the next slide. Um, yeah, it's just another cartoon of this. Um, the reason that there's a shock, of course, is that the CMEs are often expanding out uh, at speeds higher than the local alphane speed or the local fast mode wave speed. So it's a basically a nonlinear front that eventually steepens into a, into a shock in front of the flux rope. And that typically happens around five to 10 solar radii. And that seems to agree with the, the timing of the measurements of, of when these, these gradual SEP events uh, start to happen. Uh, but what I want to talk about is some of the physics of actually how does how do, how does how do these thermal particles of only 100 eV eventually get boosted in energy up to mega and giga electron volt scales? So the next slide, I guess this is just sort of a history of some of the ideas that were proposed. Uh, Enrico Fermi in the 1940s proposed this idea that's now called Fermi acceleration. Um, it's basically the fact that as particles are flying around into regions of different uh, different strength magnetic fields, they can be deflected. You, I'm, I'll bet you've heard of this idea of a magnetic bottle. Also, this is what happens in the Earth's magnetosphere as the uh, particles go from pole to pole, from strong field to weak field to strong field again. They get reflected from the strong field regions. So you can almost think of them as sort of elastic collisions with a wall. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen the physics demonstrations where you throw a ball at a wall, comes back elastically, but if the ball, if the wall is approaching you, the ball actually gets reflected back with a much higher kinetic energy because uh, because it, the the conservation of momentum is happening in the frame of the wall. But in your frame, the fact that it's coming towards you, you get extra energy. If the wall is receding away from you, the ball gets reflected back with much less kinetic energy. And Fermi's idea was that, sure, you can have a, a, a random sort of stochastic distribution of, of magnetic, magnetically strong regions that cause this reflection. And some will accelerate the particles, some will decelerate the particles. But on average, you'll, you'll tend to see a net acceleration because of this, because the, 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 the particles that you're looking at are also in motion relative to all these other things. And you'll see more. Uh, you'll see more things heading towards you than heading away from you. And I just list the highway analogy here, right? If you're, if you're on a big highway and you count the cars that are passing you, there's more oncoming cars that are passing you in every minute than the ones that you see pass you uh, on your side. Um, unfortunately, though, this random 
uh, uh, stochastic version of the Fermi acceleration mechanism doesn't work. And so something else was needed. There are some other ideas about the electric field in coronal reconnection sites that might help accelerate particles. Electric fields are good at doing that. Magnetic fields aren't because they don't do work on the particles. Uh, but the dominant idea is now this second kind of Fermi acceleration that happens due to MHD shocks. And the next slide actually shows that for some reason, you know, shocks are not just uh, walls where th that are rigid walls. Mass is flowing through the shocks. And when you end up looking at the particles on both sides of the shock, um, it, 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 it seems counterintuitive, but when you're looking at particles that cross the shock from, say, side one to side two, it's, it's actually the case that the, that the plasma on the other side is approaching you. But then when you're going from side two to side one, the plasma on the other side is approaching you. It's like a win-win scenario. They, the cars are approaching you from both sides of, on both sides of the highway. So in that case, every single collision as, as the particle crosses through the shock um, results in an energy gain. So it's a much more efficient process than, the, the, than what Fermi originally thought. So particles gain energy after every crossing. And if the, part, if the magnetic field is not exactly perpendicular to the plane of the shock, then that means that the gyro motions of the particles are, are crossing if, they're, if you're in the vicinity of the shock. That gives you the, the, the way that the particles cross back and forth across the shock many, many times. So, so, so some small fraction of the particles that are very near the shock can actually gain huge amounts of energy because they cross it many, 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 many times. And yeah, this is this meth this mechanism seems to work. The next slide, I guess, shows that yeah, what we actually measure are the particles that eventually escape the shock after being accelerated many times. Um, so yeah, we we have detailed measurements of the energy spectrum and the total number of these escaping particles, and there are models uh, that that seem to work, but. You know, there's there's still a lot of research to do. There's a lot of details about the the, the geometry of these shocks and how they work. You know, where's the magnetic field, uh, as opposed, you know, compared to the to the to the to the geometry of the shock front. How strong is the shock? There are some nice theories that say that if you know the the strength of the shock, the the magnitude of the density jump across the shock, you can actually work out analytically what the slope of the power spectrum of particles versus energy should be. Um, that's just one of these expressions that's often seen in this field. Um, if, the, if the CME is finite, right, if it doesn't, it's not extending all the way around the sun, it just has a finite extent. So eventually the particles escape that way. There's waves and turbulence in the vicinity of the shock that can make it a very corrugated surface also. And one of the big unknowns in this field is the so-called seed particle problem. Right, you've got to start with particles that are sort of in the thermal core of the velocity distribution, or maybe a little bit out of the core, that, that are the ones that get accelerated. Um, but there's a lot that we don't know about how that works. But one of the things that we do seem to know is that when one CME goes off and then another CME happens in its wake, those are the ones that can generate the strongest uh, and most dangerous uh, energetic particle storms. And what we think is that that first uh, CME sort of seeded the ground with slightly suprathermal particles that are a little bit you know, hotter than the, the original thermal core of the solar wind. Um, and then that second one came through and the, the second shock came through and, and really uh, enabled those particles to get accelerated. Uh, many, it enabled many of them to get accelerated up to the, uh, the, the, the high energies. Yeah, was that all I had? I think so. Uh, I think so, yeah. 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 Uh, thank you. That was quite clear. What, by the way, I was going to ask, is this uh, diagram in the middle of here from one of the papers, the Bell or the Lee paper? No, it's from, it's from Nick Murphy's uh, lecture notes on particle acceleration that went into much, much more detail. And in the, on the YouTube video, I can add the, uh, I can add the link to that because uh, that's on the web too. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so to wrap up uh, in the last couple of minutes we have here, um, I'm going to touch briefly on space weather aspects of CME. We'll go into much more detail in the next uh, couple of lectures on this, but I just wanted to show you really quickly uh, 
you see a lot of diagrams of CMEs and you see a lot of diagrams of Earth that look make it look like it's right next to the sun and the CMEs hitting it. It's huge. It's very confusing. Uh, this, however, is an accurate depiction of a CME leaving the sun to scale and hitting the Earth. So if we play the movie, what I want you to gather from this is the sheer size of CMEs as they expand out into interplanetary space. You can see the pancaking as they uh, are dragged by the solar ambient solar wind uh, going out into space. And as we all know, the Earth sits out at about 200 solar radii. So when we get there, we now zoom in to this particular aspect of the CME. And there is the Earth in the magnetosphere. So that is the scale um, range that we have to deal with when we talk about space weather. And in particular, just looking at that, if you say to yourself, how am I going to predict the, the magnetic field of that structure when it hits this little tiny target out of 200 R, RS? Um, that kind of encapsulates the, the biggest problem in space weather prediction right there. So we'll talk more about that next week. This is a very interesting movie showing an actual CME coming off of the sun from the stereo A mission in this case back in 2013 when it was off ahead of the Earth in its orbit, looking back at the Earth. There's the Earth. So this is actually. The sun is not to scale here, uh, but this is actually to scale from the Earth to the sun. And you can see the coronagraphs uh, there. And then this is the heliosph heliospheric imaging instrument showing a CME erupting towards the Earth right there and then propagating out all the way to the Earth. Now, one of the things I want you to get from this movie is that the complexity, again, of this structure as it's propagating in interplanetary space it's not a nice three-part structure. There's no evident shock when we get out this far. Uh, there's no sheath region really that you can identify in this, although it, there is and from in situ observations, indications that the sheath and the shock, of course, are still there as coherent structures. But again, this just shows the sheer complexity of the structure as it's propagating in, in interplanetary space. And when you talk about space weather, you're generally trying to predict what the interaction is going to be with a planet like the Earth or Mars, for instance, and uh, at, at very large distances out from the sun. So that's, um, I think, a good preface to next week. These are some of the papers that went into making these slides. I hope it was fairly clear. These were put together pretty quickly, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. And we have reading for next week on space weather itself. This is a paper by Koskin et al. Um, on the achievements and challenges of science in, in the science of space weather. Uh, it's a relatively recent paper from 2017. So um, next week we will dive much more deeply into what it means to be a planet or a person or, or a spaceship out in this environment uh, that we call the space environment. So with that, uh, we're ending just about on time here and uh, maybe a couple of minutes for questions. I'll put a copy of the paper uh, on the web page and the Slack and all the usual places. Very good. Very good. And uh, this is an, unfortunately a very large PowerPoint file, but I'm happy to share it with people. Uh, we can put that on the on the on the website if if it does indeed uh, carry. On my website, I don't think it would fit, but <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll find a place for it. Now, certainly anybody that would like a copy, you can email me and I can send you a copy via a large file transfer. Although that didn't work when we tried it earlier, it should just generally that should work. So, okay. Alrighty. I will stop the recording. I have a quick question. If sure. You've got time. 